to find out how to turn this music off. Oh, okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Beatlemania. In about two or three minutes, we're gonna get started. So if you could find a place to sit, that'd be great. Want the music down? Music off? Yeah, you want to keep it low until I do a little bit of the introduction. Uh, I, have to, Is that okay? I have to exit out of this and turn oh, it off. Okay. Right. Should I just turn it off? Yeah, if you want to just turn it off here. Okay. He's going to do that now because he's I'll got to exit out of the room. Well, again, welcome, everybody. My name is Pauline Ellis. I think I know a lot of you in this room. I work for the San Juan National Forest. I'm the partnership coordinator, and I'm going to be um, helping to facilitate the show tonight. So the first thing we have to make sure we're clear on is if any of you were looking for the Beatles tribute to John, Paul, George, and Ringo, you're in the wrong place. That's over there in the community hall. <laughs> but if you were interested in meeting this kind of Beatle, you're exactly in the right place. And I personally am pretty overwhelmed with the attendance. Of course, we got a lot of green shirts here, but we have a lot of folks, and it's really great to see this interest. So what I would like to do the very first is I would like, through a show of hands, to get a feeling for who is here tonight, okay? So the first thing I'd like to do, since we are at Fort Lewis College, is to ask how many students we have here. All right. Great. And how many other FLC um, faculty or staff do we have? Yes, all right, great. Oh yeah, that's right, Randy, you go, you go more than one way on that question. Okay, so then I'll ask the other question um, that Randy gets to raise his hand on is, how many of you actually make your living in the woods? Okay, and how many of you are with a government agency? I know that, that's probably not a good question to ask, but you know, we gotta know. But it's not just the feds, it's not just a forest service, it's folks like Butch who have other concerns with um, local government, so that's great. Um, and then I guess the other category would be how many of you like to play in the woods and are here? Yes, and everybody probably should raise their hand on that one. I think about a lot of our partners who, who are helping the forest service all the time out in the woods. Um, okay, great. So is there any other category that you guys want to mention on why you're here tonight? Yes. Firewise. Firewise, thank you. Another one of our wonderful partners, thank you. Great, wonderful. Well, we're so glad that you're all here and we're really hoping that we get to do a few things tonight. You get to meet the Beatles and learn a little bit about the current situation um, in Southwest Colorado. And then um, you're gonna learn about how we would love the public's participation in helping the Forest Service move forward with the strategy um, to 
tackle, I guess, the current beetle epidemic that we have. So let me do a few logistics right now, okay? We have got restrooms for those of you in the back of the room. Um, go out that door. I don't think those are accessible, but I know there's some more restrooms out this door, and I think those are accessible. Um, also, in case of emergency, I think you can see there's an exit sign there. I know you can go out across the hall and there's stairs down that way. You can also turn left and go out that front door too. So in case of emergency, we'll all know how to vacate the premises. Um, the other really nice thing, we'd like to, to thank um, Mitch back there but this is actually being live streamed right now. And it will also be available, I think, in FLC's YouTube library, is that right? And I think, um, Anne, did we get that contact information out to folks? But anyway, if you wanna go back and look at the presentation again, it's available. And we thank, we thank you for um, providing that to us, Mitch. Okay, so with that said, one more time uh, to review, the purpose of our meeting tonight is to gain a baseline shared understanding of the current beetle epidemic going on and what the situation is here on the San Juan National Forest. We're going to hear from three speakers tonight, the first being um, Kara Chadwick, our forest soup. Then we'll have our bug guy, who I'll introduce later. And then we have our forester that can, uh, she's gonna have a, some maps, right? And, some information on what we know about where the beetle currently is. So, with no further ado, um, I would like to introduce Kara Chadwick. She's our forest soup on the San Juan National Forest. Kara, you've been here almost a year, almost a year now. She's worked, I know it's hard to believe she looks so young, but she's been working, and she's not my boss either, but she's been working. <laughs> here for uh, your career has been 28 years with the Forest Service she's got a great background she's been in Virginia Idaho Montana Arizona Oregon even Washington DC but we won't hold that against her <laughs> and now she's in the best place of all Southwest Colorado Amen. so thank you Kara Well, thank you for that introduction, Pauline. So welcome, everyone. Welcome and thank you for your interest in this topic. And thank you for being here tonight, taking time. I know we all have busy schedules. And taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about what's going on out on our national forest. Um, I wanted to kick this meeting off tonight because I wanted to give you a little bit more uh, background around why we're having this meeting now. You know, why here, why now, what's the science meeting about? And I also wanted to talk about um, after this meeting, where do we go from here? Are we just having this meeting? Are we just talking about the science, the spruce beetle, or are, are we going to do anything about it? So are the, th those are the two things that I'd like to talk about in my quick 10 minutes. I think that Pauline probably has a hook if I go past that. So I gotta keep it moving. <laughs> so this meeting tonight was designed to give us all a common understanding of uh, the, uh, you know, the spruce beetle um, dynamics um, and around the spruce beetle epidemic. And from there, after we have this common understanding, at some point down the road, we have, we're going to be scheduling some other meetings. I'd like to talk about what we can actually do about it. Um, uh, do about some of the conditions on the ground. So why here, why now? Why are we making this a priority to address the spruce beetle? Well, I know you're all thinking, that's obvious, it's here. The spruce beetle is here now. Um, who of us hasn't driven across Wolf Creek Pass and noticed, witnessed the vast areas of dying spruce? I drove over from the east when I came over, and so, of course, my first introduction to the forest was driving over Wolf Creek Pass and noticing all those dead spruce and wondering, 
Are we doing anything about this? Can we do anything about this? How are we going to address it? So that's what we're here tonight to talk about. But, you know, it's not just the fact that we have the beetle here and now. There's, uh, there are other reasons to begin moving forward to address, the, uh, to address what's going on out there. Now, the San Juan National Forest doesn't have the extent of mortality that the Rio Grande does, at least not yet. So there are other reasons, and, and not just the beetle. Anytime that we look at moving a project forward, or a proposal, I should say, when we're looking at proposals to move a proposal forward, we th I think there needs to be three components to make a good project. And the first component is ecological. There should be an ecological need on the ground. There should be a need to do something out there. Then there's the economic need, or you got to have the economic aspect. Can we feasibly that project? Do we have the money to implement that project? And then the third is the social, but the social is why we're here tonight. That's where you come in. You'll provide that social aspect. And so is there a social need, or at the very least, is there social support for a proposal to move forward? So we have the ecological aspect. We, I think we can agree on that. We have the beetle. We have large areas of mature and over mature spruce. But we also have the economics. We have the Montrose Mill, who is wanting to buy spruce. And if we can sell our spruce, if we can actually get money for dead, you know, the dead trees out there and utilize those dead trees, not only sell them, but we can also possibly get enough money to reforest after we harvest or to reforest in areas that haven't come back that we don't harvest or to do weed mitigation activities or um, other activities across the forest. The other aspect of the economics also is that we need to sustain and support our local industry. Without them, obviously, it's not as economical to go out and get anything done on the ground. We have to use our own money to do the logging, and that leaves less money then to get other work done on the ground. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to have, have that local industry. And we did used to have more mills here in Colorado, and I'm sure many of you can remember that. And they are dependent on having some type of sustainable supply of logs. So, um, so it's good to support our local industry. Um, what else? So we have a mill that wants our logs. We have that ecological need, and what's missing is the social. And again, that's why we're here tonight. We want to start having a dialogue with you, the public, to understand what it is, you know, how you think we should respond. So the objective tonight, as I said, is to really gain a, gain a common understanding of where we're at with the spruce beetle. Um, Tom's going to help us with that, I hope. And also to see what, you know, what can, what can we reasonably expect to accomplish on the, on the ground? And Tom's going to tell us a little bit about that as well. So we want you to help us develop a strategy. And, um, and we will, as I said, we will have further meetings, um, more meetings after this, where we'll actually sit down and start developing some proposals with you. But that gets me into my second topic, and uh, you know, how do we move? How do we move forward? Although before I go into that second topic, I do want to bring up. I think it's important to emphasize that if we do move into the spruce fir, get any uh, get some activities going in there, it's just one aspect of an already ongoing uh, vegetation management program. We have. Um, we will continue to treat aspen stands over uh, on the west side of the forest to maintain and uh, to maintain those aspen stands and keep them healthy and also support the two aspen mills over there. We will also continue to support the long-term stewardship contract over on the Pagosa district, which is uh, accomplishing needed high-priority fuels reduction work on the ground. 
And another aspect of our vegetation management program is our hazardous, hazardous fuels reduction activity across the forest, uh, where we use prescribed fire and other mechanical uh, means. So we will continue, this will just be integrated in with that overall vegetation management program. So back to spruce fir. And what did I want to say about that? Okay, so to date, we, all we've done to date is develop maps, um, start looking at what our spruce fir type is, how it, you know, the mosaic across the forest, take a look at what the beetle activity is in there with our forest health uh, maps that we have. And um, so those, we're just mapping out large areas of opportunities. We haven't zeroed in on anything yet. That's where you'll be coming in. Um, we have, you know, we'll put the wilderness boundaries on there. We'll stay off of s steep and fragile slopes. And, um, and then just bring these maps to you for, for your review. So while you're also providing the input on where we should go, we're also using our forest plan. We have a brand new forest plan. We're using that as a guide. And we're also using, at least right now, the National Western Bark Beetle Strategy as a guide to help us prioritize where we might want to go with proposals. And the, the bark beetle strategy prioritizes these areas. The first is for safety. We would remove um, hazard trees in high use areas. The second um, priority might be for recovery where we would do mainly reforestation type activities, um, noxious weed treatment and other mitigation type activities. And the third area is for re resiliency. And um, debated on whether to bring up that word or not. But resiliency basically is the ability of an ecosystem and its component, uh, component parts to recover or absorb large disturbances. So this means that this is where we actually talk about maybe getting into treating some green trees um, and maybe change the mosaic of spruce fir across the landscape. So as I mentioned before, it is time for that social aspect. Um, we'll be using all this to guide us, but what we really want is for all of you to provide that input. And so after this meeting, we are going to be scheduling meetings at each of the districts where we can sit around a map, and I'm hoping for really good involvement like we have this evening, and sit around the map and start identifying areas where you think it should be a priority to treat and also areas where you think it's a red flag. Maybe we shouldn't enter. So with that, you know, that's as far as we've gone. Potential opportunities. I, I still want to make it very clear that we are coming to you with a clean slate and not a proposal. So we're relying on you for that. But again, thank you for your attendance this evening. Really appreciate this interest. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy uh, Tom and Lori's talk, and I will turn it back to Pauline. So thank you. Thanks, Kara. Yeah, have a seat. Show just started. So what I want to do right now is just give you a little roadmap for the rest of the evening. And um, we've got our bug guy coming up next. Hey, hey, yeah, that's you. And he is um, really our main speaker. He's going to talk about the current spruce beetle activity, the spruce beetle ecology, and impacts on human activities of this little beetle guy. And I think your presentation is going to go somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 minutes. We're going to do Q&A just for Tom after that. So hopefully you guys can hold your questions. I know you're going to have a lot of them, but because of time, we're going to try to hold our questions till um, Tom's done. After that, we'll have a short presentation from Lori to talk about the current situation, a little more on um, getting specific to the San Juan National Forest in southwest Colorado. And after Lori goes, we're going to bring Kara, Lori, and Tom back up to the front 
for some more Q&A, okay? We're hoping to wrap things up around 7.30. I have a feeling there's going to be more questions, so um, feel free to come and go, you know, as you need. And I'm pretty sure these folks and a lot of our other folks, and I forgot to point out we have many Forest Service folks and ex-Forest Service retired folks in the audience that are very knowledgeable about beetles, about the ecology, and um, the folks in uniform would be glad to answer your questions as well, okay? So with that, I'd love to introduce Tom Eager. He's also a modest guy. He didn't give me much, but we learned that he is employed with the Forest Service. That's good. <laughs> He works for the forest health staff, and you're stationed in Gunnison. Um, this is going to be your 21st summer in southwest Colorado, so you have lots of um, local knowledge and experience. And his work area certainly does include the San Juan National Forest, and I know you come down here every chance you get, right, Tom? He studied forest insects throughout the West, as well as in... Latin America and Asia. And we're very, very honored and privileged to have him speak to us tonight. So thank you, Tom. Honored and privileged. I, it's pretty exciting today because I get to wear green clothes at St. Patrick's Day and talk about bugs all in the same day. So this is really hitting a pinnacle here. And I gotta, I gotta watch the time because I will chase rabbits if you guys let me. Whoops, wrong button. Point it there. Make your best to raise it closer. Oh, okay. I'll just go here. I'll go walk back and forth. Okay. So I can't, can't believe 21 years. Uh, he. The very first summer I was here in southwestern Colorado, I did come down to the, I was on the San Juan, and uh, some of the faces in this room I, I remember from that very first summer, and just, the, the time just flies. But this is, the, you know, the conditions, you guys have all seen, this actually is uh, up on Wolf Creek Pass, and this is coming down on the Pagosa side, but uh, a, an un, not an unfamiliar scene, particularly if you've been on the, the Rio Grande side. And we'll uh, talk a little bit more about that, about the, the spatial dynamics of this outbreak. But this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. You know, what is going on out there? We'll, we'll get into some of the biology of the beetle itself. And, and why now? Kara uh, hit that pretty well there. Why are we talking about this now? And what will the response be? And actually, we're not going to tell you what the response will be. I'm going to just tell you some of the opportunities out there. And again, Kara hit it right on the head. This is, these are public lands, and it's up to the public to decide what the direction is going to be on this stuff. So we're going to put all the cards on the table, and, and it'll be you, you folks' responsibility in the long run to figure out what's going to be done out there. So this is the uh, state of Colorado, and this is the, sort of the story that's been going on the last uh, five years period here. And if you have been subscribing to the, to the Denver Post, the Denver Post was having an article about mountain pine beetle just about every day there at the peak of the outbreak. And actually, this line goes that way. It, it's come down quite a bit. And you can see where we are now, minuscule amounts of mountain pine beetle. And that was mostly up in the northern part of the state, going up into Wyoming, uh, the Granbury area, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, some of those areas where we saw the brunt of the uh, mountain pine beetle activity. Well, at the same time, what we've seen is this uh, green activity, the spruce beetle, and really just building up over time. And you can see where the line's headed. So that's, that's what the big concern is of what we're talking about. So he, here's what I call the big five within the state. Uh, Subalpine fur mortality, those, those little black spots you see scattered around. And before these big outbreaks occurred, we had more of the subalpine fir mortality uh, than any other source of dead trees throughout the state. Now, we call it subalpine fir mortality. We don't assign it to a particular organism because it's usually a combination of root disease and another insect called western balsam bark beetle. So they kind of work together and pick out uh, groups of trees, individual trees, and you can see how widely scattered it is. Western spruce budworm, that sort of magenta colored there, 
uh, really picked up this last year and in the southern part of the state. Feeds heavily on some of our shade uh, tolerant species, Douglas fir, the true firs, and that is the defoliator. Not a tree killer in, for the most part, but if you get uh, a number of successive years of defoliation, you can get highly stressed trees, some will die, but actually opens the door for the, this yellow uh, area, and that's Douglas fir beetle. Douglas fir beetle has also been increasing over the past several years. And then the spruce beetle, we'll talk about that more, and then the mountain pine beetle. That's, you know, from an area that was about that big, it's, it's really coalesced down into the smaller area, uh, working its way towards the front range. Okay, is that better? Right on my chin. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so here's that, that spruce beetle activity last year. 480,000 acres of spruce beetle activity within the state. And again, that uh, line just keeps going up. So we're going to go through a series of, of, of maps here starting in 2005. And you'll be able to see the movement of these beetles here. So maybe I better point out where we are. This is the, the Rio Grande for the most part. And then the, the San Juans, there's Pagosa down here. But also up here, the, the Grand Mesa, you'll, you'll want to keep an eye on that. And then over here in the wet mountains, that's our, our biggest areas of activity. So we'll follow this through the years. So here we are. This is, this is last summer's uh, survey work done. And it's, it's really the hot spots now are, are this, this uh, northern edge on the GMUG National Forest. Those guys are really uh, quite thankful to the Rio Grande for sharing with them uh, that activity. But they also have some, you can see some fairly significant activity that Grand Mesa has really uh, taken off in the, in the wet mounds. And then somebody just seen before the talk, someone was asking about the Sangres. It's really, in the last few years, really taken off in the Sangres. So this is the five-year sort of uh, roundup of what's going on. And you can really see that epicenter uh, on, the, on the Rio Grande National Forest. <clears throat> well, I thought it'd be good right now to talk about, you know, we all look at these maps and we all see these big red blobs out there. But what does that really mean? And this is a, a program called ADS, Aerial Detection Survey. And there are, uh, there's an entomologist in this plane right now. And this is the actual uh, plane that we uh, put up every summer. And they fly throughout the, uh, the forested lands. And I have some sort of caveats for you in a minute here. But if you can imagine, it's a summer day. Uh, they try to get up there when the, when the currents are not too heavy. You know, you're not bouncing around too much. But it gets quite warm up there. You're bouncing around. We used to actually do use paper maps. And you'd look at the paper map, and you'd look at the ground. And then you draw a circle on the map, and you look at the ground and figure out what kind of tree it was. You mark the little number on there. Then you figure out what was killing the tree. All the while, you're bouncing up and down, going 180 miles an hour. So there's quite a bit of art to this. And there's some things you really got to think about when you look at these maps. We're not, you know, we show those lines going up. We're not looking at every acre. They call that wall to wall. We tried that for a couple years. And the costs and the, the amount of, of energy that went into it, we were just not able to keep up that level of activity. So you, you got to take that with a grain of salt. When you look at these maps, you'll say, wait a minute. They drew a circle here. And the very next year, they drew a circle in the same spot. How can the tree die twice? Well, what they're doing is they're looking at the whole stand. and if 10% of the trees die one year, and 10% of the trees die another year. That's how they rate getting a circle in the same spot for multiple years. So you can't just take all these lumps, these blobs, and add them up. You got to do some subtraction and, and find out where the overlap is. And it's, it's more of a picture in time. We're trying to get that instantaneous picture of it. These different agents, the agents are the things that are causing this mortality, spruce beetle, Douglas fir beetle. They all have a different way they look. And Douglas fir, or excuse me, spruce beetle is the most difficult one to, to see from the air, to see from a distance. 
those trees. If you've all seen, you know, when we had the big uh, pinion pine uh, beetle outbreak down here, those beetles that hit the tree and boom, those things would turn bright red. You'd see that tree in your neighbor's yard that very summer. Spruce beetle, a little different. It's the most difficult signature to, to pick up with your eyes. I already talked about art or science. There is quite a bit of art to it. And really the, the most useful way to use this information is to look at the trends within a given area or even the state as a whole. So looking at those trends and, and not trying to transcribe that to specific spots on the ground is really the best way to, to use that data. Okay, so here we have, they're not really this big, sorry, but this is the, the spruce beetle, and it's in that uh, genus here, Dendroctinus is the genus, and dendro, if you study dendrology, you're studying trees, and tonus is the killer. So this whole group is the uh, tree killer group. It's a cousin to the mountain pine beetle, which is very active in pine trees. Uh, Douglas fir beetle is a dendroctinus. It's a, a very aggressive group of bark beetles. Bark beetles are one of the largest groups of insects. Uh, many major pests, or many major crops have uh, uh, den uh, bark beetle pests. The coffee berry borer is one of the, the most feared pests of coffee trees. And they all concentrate on feeding on wood and woody parts of trees. And there's so many of them because some of these bark beetles will work in the very tip top of the tree. They specialize in, in tips. And other ones work in, the, in just branches. And other ones in the bowl of the tree. That's most of the killers. But other ones are underground feeding on the roots. So, you know, people wonder why we have so many different kinds of insects. It's because they're such specialists. They're all doing a certain thing out there on the forest. So just a little capsule of the, the biology here. And pretty much everything I say in the next half hour or so, there's going to be an exception to it. You know, that's just the way that insects are. For example, this two-year life cycle, yeah, about 90% of these spruce beetles, maybe 95% of them, have a two-year life cycle. But at certain times, they'll go into a one-year life cycle. When it, conditions get warm and particularly favorable, they'll speed up their generation time. And conversely, at those higher elevations, it'll take them three years to get through their life cycle. So right off the bat, we're seeing an exception to the rule there. One host species, yeah, for the most part, they're attacking Engelmann spruce. And we've talked, I've talked to some folks in here already about their blue spruce. They're not seeing the activity of spruce beetle and blue spruce. But there are times when they will get after that blue spruce. In fact, up at Cascade Creek, uh, just up uh, on the highway here, I have never seen so many blue spruce get hit. So again, an exception to the rule. Finally, there's this last category, the behavior uh, mediated by semiochemicals. And semaphores are signals you give. Semiochemicals are uh, signal-giving chemicals. And this is their communication system. Now, I could easily get up here and ramble on for a couple hours just about pheromones. It's really interesting stuff. We don't have enough time tonight, but it's something to keep in mind when you look at their behavior across the landscape. So there's, that's, that gives you a better idea of how big they are. And here's the life cycle. This is the, the typical two-year life cycle, and they're early flyers. They will actually fly over snow, and it's the females that emerge first from their old host tree looking for that susceptible host tree. And she'll go in there, she'll bore in through the bark, she'll lay the eggs, and these larvae hatch out. And the larvae feed, feed through that first summer, and then as spring comes on, or as winter comes on, the cold weather causes them to, to have one of their major tricks. People always wonder, these are insects. The cold will kill them. Well, what they do is, where they feed is underneath the bark where this very uh, sugar-rich material is. And they're able to take these sugars as the weather gets cooler and switch it into in glycol, which is a very closely related compound. Well, glycol is Prestone antifreeze you put in your car. So they fill their bodies with, with antifreeze. They pass through the winter. And then when things warm up, they do their biochemical trick again, and they flip those molecules back. They have sugars in their body, and they start feeding again. So they feed through that whole second year, and then towards the end of that second summer, they'll turn into adults. In some cases, they'll just stay where they are. In other cases, they'll come out and go into the uh, base of the tree. But it's that next spring, after they've killed the tree, that they'll emerge to start the process all over again. 
So if you're a, a homeowner, landowner, and you're, you're wondering if your, your trees have beetles in them, it's not like a pine beetle where you get these big, heavy, gloppy pitch tubes that are, you know, you can see them from a distance. You really got to go up and look at these trees. And what this is is little patches of, of, of boring dust, and each one of those boring dust piles is an entry site. So you can see how heavily they're attacking this tree here. It looks like that stuff is, you know, just light, fluffy, powdery. But actually, if you pick it up with your fingers, because of the uh, pitch in there, it's, it's very sticky. So it, it, you put it in your fingers, and you can make a little wad out of it. So you'll see all this powder, and especially down at the base of the tree, that powder starts to build up. So if you've got spruce trees, you've got Engelmann spruce trees, mature Engelmann spruce trees, you go out there and you look for this. If you see this powder, that's, that's the, the warning sign. That's, that's what you don't want to see. They, they laid their eggs along here. And these larvae hatch out. They look like little worms, although I hate to say that. It's not technically correct. But they do look like little worms, and they're feeding under there. Here's a close-up. This one's just about ready to go to the resting stage because while they're feeding, they're, they're filling themselves with this material, this frass. But just before they pupate, they evacuate the uh, digestive system, and they turn into these bone-white uh, entities, pupil stage here, and they've actually formed these pupils. They emerge from those pupil chambers. We call those callow adults or tenoral adults. They're, they're pre-emergent, and they'll spend a little bit more time under the, the bark they're feeding, and then they're ready to go. These, these beetles are getting ready to emerge. Uh, this is probably early June or so, and they're getting ready to bore out through that final bit of bark, emerge into the forest, and find some new hosts, which starts the process again. And I, I probably should have put this one first, because you can see these are the eggs here. Now, if you, if you peel back the bark, you suspect a tree is, is under attack by bark beetles, you can take your hatchet or your knife and, and peel back that bark, and you, these eggs are easily visible. You can see them there underneath the bark, although I'm starting to wear glasses when I look at them. So, <laughs> so I, I almost left this slide because it's getting into more of the technical realm, but I had to point it out because Bob Fry from Pagosa Springs uh, worked with this other scientist, John Schmid, and came up with this Bruce, uh, spruce risk rating system. And these are the types of trees that the spruce beetles are most interested in. Again, not always. We're always going to see exceptions. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But in general, they're looking for large trees. That average diameter is getting to the large size. They're actually looking for places that have nice, thick floam in them that that's, uh, sugary material that I was talking about. So places like creek bottoms are at very high risk. The density of the stand, the number of trees out there makes a big difference. And if you, if you take sort of a mercenary approach and look at trees as just water pumps with leaves on them, they're constantly bumping that, pumping that water out from the site. And if you have a high density of spruce trees out there, they'll go under moisture stressor more quickly and the, the beetles will be more interested in them. And then finally, the last one, the purer the stand, the more spruce is in the stand, the more interested they are. And all these things are very interrelated if you look at the, the way spruce trees grow. Those stands that are high populations, high percentage of spruce in them are probably big. So these things all fit together. So I'm, I'm going to throw out a couple definitions here, and you'll see both of these uh, revolve around the, the change changing. And so this is succession. This is the process that if you, if you kind of look at an acre of forest and follow it through time and the different changes that occur out there, that's what succession is. And I'll, I'll probably be using that term a few more times this evening. Next one is disturbance. And again, we're using this word change here. But we're looking at the, the environmental condition, the way environmental conditions are altered as a result of an incident. So, you know, we're calling what we're seeing out in the forest a disturbance event in terms of spruce beetle here. So here's another disturbance event, and this is closely tied to spruce beetle once again. This is a wind throw event, 
And you can see spruce, very shallow-rooted species. They've had a microburst come through here and knock all these trees down. And now this is, you know, the early summer or so. And these trees represent a valuable food source for the beetles. If you look at the beetles, they're, they're herbivores, right? They're feeding on plants, but they act like predators. They're out there looking for trees that have been hit by lightning, trees that a top has been knocked out of one way or another. They're looking for trees that have been injured, just like a wolf pack looks for the moose that's limping, right? These beetles are out there looking for trees that have, are under some sort of stress or some sort of injury. Well, these trees have no defenses left. They're, this is just a big McDonald's uh, hamburger stand out there for the beetles. They fly around, they find this, and because they're able to get in there so easily, they don't burn a lot of energy attacking these trees, and they lay lots of eggs. So you have a situation where you have these epicenters of down trees, the beetles get into them, they lay lots of eggs, the numbers build up, and then they start to spread out into the adjacent stands. So that's a disturbance event closely tied into the, the eventual beetle disturbance event. Another disturbance event is drought. I started showing you those photos from 2005. That's when the stuff really started showing on the map. But as we we're out in the forest looking around, 2002, the big drought year, right? The, your big pinion beetle outbreak occurred 2003, 2004, right on the heels of this drought event that we had. This was the year of the Hayman fire, the Million fire. A lot of big events happened that year, and it was a combination of this wind throw activity, these little epicenters, and now you have the surrounding trees under a lot of stress, and these are the things that incited the outbreak. So I had my technician uh, put this together for me, and they insisted on doing some fancy stuff with making these words appear. <laughs> but this is the fire triangle. And you, you, know, you study this in school. You got to have these three elements to have a, a fire going. You got oxygen, heat, and fuel. When you combine those things and, and a, a trigger event or a spark or something, that's how you get fire. Well, it's the same way with spruce. OK. Same way with spruce beetle. We have this weather event, this drought occurring. We've had stand conditions of these bigger, older, denser trees. And we've had beetle populations that were nearby and, and able to respond. This is a publication put out by uh, University of Colorado. And a lot of people have this idea that after the settlement period, settlers came in and cut all the trees. And as a result, we have less trees. We have smaller trees on the landscape. But this is a book of stereo pairs. Here's the first one, or excuse me, photo pairs. And back 100 years ago, they were taking a photograph of this train here, of course, and the new uh, railroad and the trestle they'd built. That's why they took the picture. But they went and recreated these photos 100 years later. And look at that vegetation in the meantime. Here's another pair. Again, these are on the front range. This is not spruce beetle. But this is a common story throughout Colorado of how much vegetation and how heavy that vegetation has become in the intervening period. Now, if you were taking a forest etymology class, you would get extra credit for telling me this is a fellow named A.D. Hopkins. And he is known as the father of forest etymology here in America. He started out as a subsistence farmer in West Virginia and ended up getting an honorary degree from Harvard for his work in forest etymology. And I bring him up because in, at the turn of the century, 1902, he left Washington and made his way out west here to record the activities of forest insects. And that's A.D. Hopkins here. And that is the pathologist with a typical pathologist happy look on his face <laughs> named Von Schrenk. Oh, it's fun to make fun of those guys. <laughs> but he made this big trip out here and came out with this paper right at the turn of the century on bark beetles throughout the west. Now, there has been a lot of discussion about the impacts of fire in these spruce fir stands. And it was, you know, when things were really getting going on the Rio Grande, a lot of uh, arguments about, well, spruce doesn't burn. Spruce never gets in the condition where you have to worry about fire. And if they had just gone back and looked at this stuff from 100 years ago, they would have seen that A.D. Hopkins reported this. Spruce beetle followed up by fire. So I don't want to get off in the fire thing too much, 
but uh, I'm not a fire guy, but uh, there's certainly a connection there. Here's the other thing I find just fascinating. So here we have the airplanes with the computers and the GIS and everything. He did this with pen and ink from the back of a horse. And boy, it's, it's pretty close to what we got going on right now. To update things a little bit more, again, we have uh, John Schmidt and Bob Fry working on this. And the, the last big outbreak we had here in Colorado was on the uh, White River National Forest. And this was the pattern they saw, where you get these smaller outbreaks of spruce beetle. But eventually, stand conditions would be such that you got this stand replacing situation here. And that was that big outbreak. And I think a lot of places, particularly on the Rio Grande, that's what we're seeing now. This is, uh, again, updated some information. And going back all the way in the 50s, and this is basically the, both sides of the, of the measuring balance here, the, of the weight balance here. So you have growth, and then you have losses. And you can see here uh, the amount of mortality and the amount of removal or, or tree harvesting here. And for all these decades, and I think going on beyond here, this growth in the forest has greatly exceeded the amount of, of losses due to both mortality and due to uh, harvesting until we hit 2006. And now we're seeing sort of the balance come back the other way. It's really not surprising we're seeing so much mortality across the landscape. I don't want to talk about uh, fires too much. There's a lot of people in this room with a lot of expertise about it here. But here we have this outbreak. This is that same White River outbreak. People saying, well, we don't have to worry about fires. This was a good 50 years after the beetle activity when they had this big fish fire this was a fire in Utah, and this one was really interesting because this one, it said the trees had lost their, for the most part, lost their needles, so they were just spars and, and you know, branch, gray branch trees. Still, the fire was burning over snow, essentially, out here. So this is, it is a cause for concern. This was the West Fork Fire, satellite image from West Fork Fire, just two summers ago. And that was the fire that occurred in the old dead spruce there and then the aftermath. Well, I, I know Dr. Franklin was thinking about uh, bark beetles when he made this statement here, because it's really true. The real way to get after bark beetles, after these tree mortality agents, is by getting ahead of the curve and by uh, doing things before you have a problem. A lot of people, you know, now that things have really gotten ro rolling, they, you know, a lot of people want to throw up their hands and say, you know, there's really nothing can be done. But this is actually up on Telluride Mountain, where several years ago we started to have an incipient bark beetle problem, spruce beetle problem out there. Now, I mentioned before how much spruce beetle like these down trees. So we turned that against them. We used this uh, process called the trap tree, where we go out and select trees, and we drop them, and you still see that green foliage there and it acts like a beetle sponge. It soaks up beetles from the surrounding forest, and instead of the beetles deciding what they're going to attack, we decide where they're going to attack. And because it's on such a heavily used area, Telluride Mountain, highly roaded, lots of eyes out in the forest, we're able to get a handle on it. So a lot of these uh, trap trees were put near roads so they could be hauled to the mill. And we also did some log peeling. So a lot of times we'll get this, well, do a trap tree operation and peel those logs. And I tell them, you do one, and then we can talk about it. Because really, pretty back-breaking work out here, uh, peeling those logs. This is another way to prevent beetles from attacking trees. Now, of course, this is not something that can be done over the forest. But if you're a homeowner, if you have campground, if you have high-value trees, this is a way to protect those trees. It's highly effective. EPA approved. This is all in the up and up. It's been tested. And it's, it, you know, if you're, a lot of people are anti-pesticides and stuff, but if you start weighing some of these things, and I'm particularly concerned with the genetic resources of some of these trees, the, the, for the next generation of trees, this is a way to protect them. And it's very effective. We're talking 95% efficacy for treating these trees. Not a lot of cost to it. Uh, you can have uh, tree service companies come into a neighborhood and treat trees for $12 or $15. Now, if you look at the values there, some of these trees on a property, if it's in the right spot, an individual tree can be rated as being worth $10,000 near a big house or something. It's not easy. It's not hard to see why 
the economic value here. So if you have really valuable trees and you do it in an environmentally safe way, protecting those trees with, with chemicals is a way to go. But here's, and Kara hit on this uh, very briefly here, but they, they, these folks, again, John Schmidt and Bob Fry, talking about us all the way in the, in the late 70s here, and this is really the crux of the situation here. Here in Colorado, at that time, the late 70s, 75% of those trees, of the spruce, were out of bounds. They were either inaccessible in a wilderness area, but essentially they were not going to be subject to any kind of management. Now, if anything, that 75% number has gone up today. So, in a large sense, we're very restricted on what the response can be to spruce beetle. Part of the answer is some forest management in certain places. If for nothing else, for human safety. If you drive up to Wolf Creek and imagine that situation near a campground, that situation near a, a trail, and the Colorado Trail goes through right some of the heaviestly infested spruce beetle uh, places in the state, those trees are going to have to be removed just for human safety fact. There's a couple ways we can go about it, and sometimes you'll hear these uh, terms, sanitation logging and salvage logging used interchangeably. That's really not quite right. Sanitation is when you're actually going after those trees that are loaded up with beetles, and you're trying to remove them from the system. Just like those trap trees, they're loaded up with beetles. We take them out of the forest and, and take those beetles out of the game. Salvage logging, though, is once the beetles have flown from the tree. The beetles have to fly into a tree, they have to kill the tree, and then they have to leave the tree. So they're only there for a very short time, for one generation. Getting there. <laughs> yeah. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, so, so, but so why, so we're not having, if you do salvage logging, we're not having any, any impact on the beetles. But there is this thing of ob obtaining revenue and initiating restoration. So there is reasons to do salvage logging as well. And here's where we're headed. A lot of planning going on. The uh, regional nursery for, for the Rocky Mountain region is in uh, Nebraska. It's Bessie Nursery. And in the last five years, they have doubled their, the amount of space that they're planning. Their production has easily doubled in the last several years. There's foresters out there as we speak collecting seed, bagging it up, and sending it back there, and they're in heavy production mode for this restoration effort. We got crews already out there planning. A lot of planning is going on in the Rio Grande National Forest. But there's also aspects to salvage logging, such as uh, jobs for local economies. It wasn't too long ago, and again, Kara must have seen my talk before I gave it, but this was just, as you drove into every town in the West, you saw one of these teepee burners. Just about every town had a small mill going out there. And now we have these very large mills. You know, we may be going back to the, the time when towns have smaller mills. It's more of a localized industry. You know, we've gotten into the thing where people are talking local food. Well, this is local resources. So I'm starting to wrap things up here. And the majority of these areas we're not going to be managing. The great majority, in fact, is, will not be managed at all. They're just out of bounds. They're either inaccessible or they're set aside by law or by uh, some, some other reason. Too, too steep, too rocky, a lot of reasons why we, the majority of these lands won't be managed at all. We're going to let nature take its course. And of course, the places we do decide to go are going to be those ones that are most economically viable, places that are close to roads, places that are at, in high value, ski areas. I, I like working in ski areas because we, you know, th there's the demonstration part of it, showing people what we can do out there, but also you have the, the facilities you can use to get out there and, and save those values on these uh, high, high economically valued lands. And then the last part here, the climate change is the wild card. And I don't the whole, the, I really don't like making predictions, and I, I'll, I have a prediction thing coming up here, mostly because of climate change. You know, people are always going, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? And it's really hard to say. And particularly in the face of climate change here, you know, what are things going to be like 40 years from now? What are things going to be like 100 years from now? 
just recently, I've gone through a bunch of these projections of these uh, weather-related uh, events that are projected under various scenarios of climate change, and boy, they run the gamut. I mean, it's everything from the surface of mercury to water world and uh, everything in between. Hundreds of these projections out there. Which one is going to be right? Somebody's going to be right. We're not really sure who. I think the answer is to get as diverse a, a landscape out there as possible. Now, this is something you can see from the highway. How, how does that look? Where's uh, Kara? Gilder. Where's Kara Gilder? How does it look, Kara? Does it look fake? <laughs> yeah. You can see what's going on. We've, we, we're debating whether we should pump this up because that signature made this really hard to see. But what this is, you can see this from the highway, all these older classes of trees, this whole ridge line here, and all this stuff in the foreground is all dead. Those are the larger age classes of trees. But back in the early 70s, mid-70s, they cut this patch cut, cut out. And I've been told since the time that this was controversial because you could see it from the highway. Well, now, 30, 30, 40 years, 43 years later, that's the green on the landscape. The stuff that was cut in the 70s is what has, is now green, and all that stuff, the, the older age class of stuff, that's the stuff that's dead. We need to have more of this uh, diversity across the landscape. This is uh, something straight out of a civil culture textbook here, and we're talking about what's called the balanced forest. And that is you have these different age classes of trees, the numbers of trees. So, you know, you, you think about fish, it's the same way, right? You have a lot of little baby fish and a lot of little baby trees, but as they get bigger and older, you get less and less. But if you look at the amount of space, the number of acres that are allotted to these different age classes, if it's a balanced forest, you should have as many acres of baby trees as you do of older trees here. And this is a theoretical model. It's not really something that you can lay on the ground, but it's, it's kind of a goal that we're shooting for. So here's my prediction. What does the future hold for the forest of Western Colorado? Well, you tell me what the weather's going to do, and I'll tell you what the beetles are going to do. If we have more, a bunch of summers like we did last summer, a long, wet summer, remember how much rain we had last summer? That will put a damper on the beetle populations. But if we have a number of summers in a row that are hot and dry, then the beetle population goes through the roof. So, did I go too far over? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, but before we start the Q&A, um, what I wanted to do was point out that tonight starts the input process, right, Kara? And we'll be able to gather information from the public. If you look on your tables, there's this public feedback, spruce beetle in the forest. And you are more than welcome to use this to provide input. And I think we've got many more sheets in case we need these. Um, the other thing is if you um, signed in, I think that's a way for us to be able to reach you. So if you didn't sign in and would like um, to be on our sign-up list or our contact list, please do that on your way out. Um, the other thing, I did want to introduce Kara and Shauna. Um, the, Kara, you are kind of ramrodding the the um, the beetle strategy right now, right, for the San Juan. And Sean is a hydrologist. She's helping as well. You, these folks are going to be um, capturing key thoughts, I guess, on the flip charts right now. There might be some things where we don't have answers tonight. Um, they'll capture them, so we'll be able to take those back. And Mitch, is there a way to know if anybody's out there in live stream land listening in? Is there anybody? All right. Woo. I thought what I'd do is I'd provide a phone number in case they had questions, they could text them in here, and we can take their questions too. So that phone number is 970-769-7743. 970-769-7743. 
7743. That'd be pretty cool if someone texted in a question. Okay, so if you folks are ready, let's start our Q&A. And what I'll have to do is, um, when there's a question, I'll repeat it so our live streamers can hear, okay? And just to warm everybody up, maybe I'll start with the first question. These little boogers, are, are these the guy? Those are the guys. All right, so everybody's got the guy on their table. If you haven't um, looked at them and played with them, feel free to do so. All right, that was I, my question. I, and if, if you want some of your own, I know where to get them. Uh-oh. <laughs> there you go. All right, do we have any more questions for Tom? So, so the question was, do the, uh, does a tree, uh, Engelmann spruce, under stress, release an odor that is attracted to the beetle? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so now we're in semiochemical land, which is a very interesting place. And you got the, the beetles look at the world completely differently from, than we do. They're so uh, odor-oriented, it's unbelievable better sense of smell than a bloodhound. And if you look at those, if you look at those little beetles in the vials, and you look at, the vi- at their head and the little teeny tiny antenna, that's where they're getting all this information from. And what you're talking about is something that forest entomologists argue about all the time. And it's called primary attraction. So there's two, two sources of attraction. We talked about when the beetles come in and the beetles themselves release an odor and it attracts other beetles in. So that's how they overcome the, the host tree's defenses, right? They attack in large numbers using this secondary atta- attraction. The question is about something called primary attraction. As these beetles are flying through the forest, can that female smell a sick tree? And can they fly to it? And there's a lot of debate on that. And the current thinking is they're not able to do that. It's what they're doing is they're, they're flying and they're landing at random. And they actually, it's not a smell they pick up, but they taste. It's gustatory cues is what they're picking up on, is, is what the current thinking is. They taste the tree, and they can taste the sick trees. So they fly through the forest at random. They land on a tree. They take a bite. Oh, this is healthy. They fly to another tree, take a bite. Ah, this one's sick. That's the tree they bore in on. But it's still a, a lot of debate. The chemistry involved here is, is incredible. Second part of your question? Uh, okay. okay. Go ahead. They they actually the 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 first attacking females are referred to as pioneer beetles, and they're the ones that make the decision we're gonna attack this tree. So they bore into the tree, and as soon as they start feeding on that phloem, that's when the they start releasing the odors. The, so so the, the process is the, the females attack the tree. They bore in the tree. They rele- release an attractive odor that attracts more females, and then they attract males in as well. So the males, there's a one-to-one sex ratio. The males come in because, believe it or not, there are monogamous bark beetles and there are polygamous bark beetles, <laughs> which leads to all kinds of jokes, which I won't go into. But they, they go in and they re- so release this attractive odor. So now you have the odor. And at, it's, the reason it's complicated is as soon as they start chewing on the tree, they're re- they are, it's like taking a nail and cut, making little cuts on the tree. And there's odors coming out there. So that's mixing. And they call it the bouquet effect. So you get a mix in the tree. And more and more beetles come in. At a certain point, they start to feel kind of crowded, like Daniel Boone, right? Feeling crowded there. They release another odor called an anti-aggregate. And that tells other beetles out there that are later emerging, there are some trees nearby here that are, you know, you're able to attack, but don't come to this particular tree. Well, of course, entomologists being the smart guys that they are, thought, why can't we take this anti-aggregate and apply it out there and tell the beetles, you know, fool them. These trees are, are actually quite uh, attractive but now this odor says they're not. Let's make the synthetic chemical. 
and put it on the trees. And it, we've had success with that, with Douglas fir beetle. And I tell people it's the only magic trick we've got. You put this material out called MCH, and it tells the beetles, don't come to this tree. The complexity of some of these chemicals, believe it or not, the molecules have a right-handedness and a left-handedness to them. The ratio has to be right. It has to be in the right sequence, or the beetles you know, get kind of nervous, and they'll, they'll shy away from those trees. But for MCH, for Douglas fir beetle, it works like a charm. We have a project going now on Fagosa District. We're treating 240 acres. A fire burned through there and made them very susceptible. And we're protecting those 240 acres just by tacking up these little odor packets on the trees. Very successful project. So haven't gotten there with, with spruce beetles. Sorry, I, I missed the first part. Um, there's places in the Congress, the tree pendants, that actually <coughs> can end up driving the tree going crazy if it was over water. And um, I'm wondering if you know more on that or if it will deactivate the whole problem for that reason. Uh, I'm still out there kicking stumps. OK, <laughs> the question cop oh, is yeah, intervening. Yeah, yeah. And so the question was that in northern Arizona University, um, they're using a fungus um, to attack the beetles that makes the beetles crazy and attack each other. And your question was whether in our part of the country, um, we've, we've experimented with fung fung fungi. fungi at all. <laughs> Thanks. There's, there's, I think you're kind of, there's two different projects going on, and one has to do with the, the fungus, and it's a fungus called Bovaria bassiniana, and it's, it's been known for quite a while. It is a, a beetle killer. It kills lots of insects. You know, if you go down to the hardware store, you could buy this other uh, material called Nosema. If you have grasshopper problems, it's the same kind of thing. But time and time again, the problem we run into with bark beetles is, how do you get to them when they're underneath the bark? How are you going to get that fungus inside of those trees? So it's, you know, we know that we can kill the beetles. And you can take a hammer and kill a bunch of beetles. But how do you get, how do you get to the individual beetles there? So you know, it's not the, the science of the, uh, you know, whether the tree's going to, or the beetle's going to live or not. It's how do, you, how do you apply that? And there's you know, a whole bunch of, of work that still needs to be done on that. The other part about the, the I know what you're talking about, the beetles uh, going crazy and killing each other, they were actually using sounds. And I, I didn't tell you the full story on the, the beetle attack thing. Because not only are they using uh, chemicals to regulate and attract and, and, and dissuade beetles from attacking the same tree, they're also using noises. They're using little clicking noises just like a, a grasshopper, that, that stridulation, they call it. And they found out if they uh, apply certain of these sounds that change over time, you know, as different numbers of beetles are in the tree, it gets more and more aggressive. If they found if they amplified that sound and applied it directly to the, the trees, yeah, the beetles would go nuts under there. But again, we're stuck with the same problem. How do we apply that on a practical basis over hundreds of thousands of acres? So. In the, in the lab is a long ways from out there in the, in the woods. So I, I'm aware of both of that, yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. The trees that are felled to attract the beetles, when you drop a tree, the beetles come into the bark of that tree, and then what happens? Do you cut the tree off, or do you take the bark off? Tell me about that. So, the, so the, the question is about trap trees. We'll, we'll drop a tree, and these actual, these trap trees, when they start hitting the ground, we, we fell those trees in the wintertime, and so they're under there, and the, all those uh, sugars and things start fermenting. There's alcohols in there, and it gets very attractive to the beetles. So it acts like a, like a big sponge. These beetles start coming in and attacking this down material. So they go through their normal life cycle there, but we stop it by either loading those logs under a log truck and taking them to the mill, or we peel off all that bark and, and kill the beetles that way. And it's just a way of concentrating them in certain areas. We're not getting, well, we are getting rid of them when we get them out of there, but if we're just peeling the logs, we're just getting them into one area, and then we're actually killing them that way. Okay? 
Tom, I love you, but I'm going to intervene and, and uh, <laughs> because you forget to repeat the question. I can and, do that one. Oh, you did? Okay. But also, <laughs> hey, we have some questions from our live stream, which is pretty cool. So if you don't mind, can we go to the live stream? And the first question from 415-994-2886 is, does a fire help rid the forest of beetles? It, Long pause, he's thinking about your question. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> You're supposed to do the Jeopardy music, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, the relationship with fire and beetles is really complex. In, in some cases, you, get, you have a fire where it'll actually attract beetles in, not so much with spruce beetle, but certainly duck fir beetle and some of the pine beetles. And in other kit situations, yeah, it can, uh, it can be a positive thing in terms of management. If you had, do as a, a trap tree type situation and you get a lot of beetles in a certain area and you burn through that area, then you can, you can remove beetles from the system. Now, up in Canada, they do this uh, thing called bait and cut, where they will take these artificial baits that we talked about a little earlier and, and bait a whole stand of trees. But we're talking, you know, well over 40 acres, sometimes 100 acres. They will bait 100 acres and try and suck in large numbers of beetles and then just clear cut the whole 100 acres at one shot. Now, here in the U.S., we, we, don't, do, we don't make cuts over 40 acres. So, you know, you got to be very careful when you use these chemicals not to overdo it. You know, we have this problem with what we call spillover, where you're attracting beetles into a situation that you may want to burn the stand. But what happens when those beetles start hopping the road and hitting the next stand over? It's, it's kind of a Frankenstein thing, actually. Okay. Thank okay. you. Randy. Uh, what's the density of beetles, like, per tree in a major acre? Okay. What uh, is the density of the beetles, maybe per tree and per acre? A lot of that... The, the way those beetles, you know, I told you how they sort of regulate the, 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 the numbers of beetles that are attacking. If it's a very sick tree and they're laying lots of eggs, they'll feel crowded sooner. So if it's a tree that has a lightning strike on it and is just going down the tubes anyway, you will find very light numbers of attacks, but the number of eggs, the number of larvae come out will be very large. Like a million per pound? Well, the, the spruce beetle, I just looked this up the other day, they, they have counted the number of eggs a female will lay, and it ranges between 80 and 150. So that's the, and, and each one of those theoretically turns into a, a larvae, I mean, each one does turn into a larvae, and then eventually emerges from there. So you're talking about, you know, some extremely exponential rates of increase there. The number of trees per acre depends on the local population. Sometimes they're just picking out one or two trees. You know, when they start out, it's sort of like a locomotive, you know. They start out very slow, and then when they pick up a head of steam, there's nothing going to stop them. So the, the, um, the density on a per acre basis, it changes over time and, and can be, you know, I've seen large areas, 50, 100 acres, go out in the course of a summer, and I'm talking 85% mortality. I mean, it's, it's amazing, depending on what that localized population is. Did I get that for you? Okay. okay. I've... This is great. There's going to be, I'll tell you right now, more questions than we can answer in Tom's time. But remember, we've got another Q&A at the end. So I think what I'll do is I'll take, we've got two more live stream questions. I'll take them. Um, I'll go here and I'll go there. And then we'll see how the time's running. Okay? And the next question is, can the beetles overwinter in downed trees when temps stay really cold? Or is there a threshold? For the most part, the, the, I, I guess I should have started at the beginning talking about how long these beetles have been around. Spruce beetle has evolved with spruce trees. They've been around for millennia here. And they have been through some cold winters. So, you know, we get that a lot. Won't the cold kill them? And actually, the trees that are down on the ground are well insulated by snow. It's the, the time when you get the most winter kill of beetles is when you have a very cold, very dry winter. And those are the times when you start to see some mortality in these, in these populations. But it takes an extraordinary winter. These beetles have a lot of tricks up their sleeves, how to make it through these very cold winters we have around here. And they're well adapted to the situation. 
So it takes an extraordinary winter. Now, I'm not going to say it's impossible because the, that big outbreak we saw on the flat tops, they put a lot of effort into trying to stop that thing. They had bulldozers out there. They had a lot of trees being cut down. They used a lot of chemicals and stuff. And they were getting to the point where they're like, we're not making any headway on this thing, right? And then they had one of these extraordinary winters. That was like 1951. And the beetle populations crashed all of a sudden. So in the end, it was cold weather that, that shut them down. But it was a cold winter in the course of a 20-year period. And I have to add also, we're not seeing those kind of winters as much as we used to anymore, those very intense winters. So, you know, it, the possibility's out there, but you sure don't want to hang your hat on it. All right. Let's go here. I think we'll put the mic on you. Thank you. Uh, do we know what caused the remarkable reduction on the mountain pine, be mountain pine beetle back then? And is this likely to be repeated with this particular beetle? So the, the question was, Pauline, <laughs> do we know what happened in the case of mountain pine beetle where we had these huge populations out there, this big outbreak, and then it, it has gone away. We saw that number going down again. And in most cases, they ate themselves out of house and home. They have really removed that mature age class of, of lodgepole pine throughout the, most of the northern part of the state, and they just had nowhere to go. I was talking a little bit earlier about how spruce beetle like to attack these big, giant trees. Well, over on the Rio Grande side, at, toward the end of areas that where we had 95, 98% mortality, they were attacking trees like that. They were so desperate. They were killing those trees, but they weren't producing any brood whatsoever. So those localized populations, they've already died out. And the good news is Rio Grande doesn't have to worry about spruce beetle for another 200 years. So. Well, we, we think, you know, I, I didn't really want, want to bring in a bunch of stand data and stuff like that and show you guys, but one of our biggest, one of the biggest factors in all of this is if you look at our different species, most of them are in these older age classes. It, people have, tend to think that, you know, most of the old growth has been cut down, but it really hasn't. There was a lot of them out there, and certainly on the Rio Grande, there was a lot of big, old, dense stands of trees, a lot of them 400 plus years old. And that's the problem with bark beetles. They like the same trees that we like. So you know, they, they got in there. And so how did they get there, though? That's the next question. And we think, yeah, this has been going on for millennia. And you know, we have these, our human lifespan of, of 80 years or so. We're only seeing a little fraction of the story. And yet, this is a thing that's been repeated time and time again, going back through the millennia. One question. We had a question over here. Okay. That answers part of it, but I wondered also if you happen to know what the flight range of those beetles are, and do they necessarily just keep themselves out of house and home, or do they continuously spread into more and more people around? The, the, these repeat, are really repeat the question, questions. please. Oh. And so this is about. <laughs> uh, so this is a question about flight range of the beetles. And how far can they travel? How far will they go? And can they escape an area when they have eaten themselves out of house and home? And there's, there's a, a couple different answers to that. Believe it or not, they have these things called flight mills where they have actually put little jackets on the beetles and then put an attractive odor so the beetles want to fly. And they're able to measure with the, the wind speed how long the beetles can keep pumping those wings. And they figure they can fly about a mile or so. So that's, if they knew where they were going, you know, they knew there was a, a good stand of trees, they could fly there. But re what really happens is, on a warm, sunny day in an infested uh, tree, the, the sunlight start hitting the bark, they start warming up, the beetles start emerging, they come out on the bark, and they'll start flying. Well, on those same warm, sunny days when you get a lot of updrafts, and so these beetles are getting up above the crowns of the trees, and basically, they're just being blown with the wind. And if you look at these uh, survey maps, you'll see a lot of movement in that south or that northeasterly direction because our prevailing winds are out of the south southwest. So they're out of the stand, and then it's luck of the draw. Now, if you have the huge numbers of beetles we have out there, you have a very good chance that they're going to land in a spot that's conducive to their life cycle. 
So here's a little story that we heard when the outbreak was really good time on the Rio Grande. A, a person was out there in their garden in Lagarita, which is basically desert. And they noticed they wanted to finish up hoeing their row of beans or whatever they're doing because they saw a, a, a thunder cell coming through. And they wanted to finish up before the, the rain came through. Well, they, and the, the, the dark clouds came through, and it, it was turbulent winds and stuff. But rain didn't come out of the clouds. Beetles came out of the clouds. These were large numbers of beetles. Now, it wasn't a cloud of beetles, but they were caught up in this upper draft. And they were, now they were in the middle of the desert. I showed you that picture from the, the fish lake fire, and, or big fish fire, and that's up by Trapper's Lake. They said the description at the time was, says there was a, a raft of beetles several inches thick, six feet out around the entire lake. So the beetles get up there and they fly, but they don't know where they're going. A lot of it is just random chance, and they're being dumped in areas. And that's why I say I've, I've seen these stands where in the course of a summer, Large numbers of beetles are getting dumped in there, and they'll wipe out a stand in the summer just by random chance. So, you know, they're not, they don't really know where they're going, but they, they get up and they can travel large distances. All right. Let's go to live stream land. And we have the question, so how long before the beetles attack Purgatory Ski Resort? An attack like we see at Wolf Creek. Prediction time. <laughs> I don't really like making predictions because these beetles are always playing tricks on us. So the question is, do we have to worry about purgatory ski? Is it going to be what we see up at Wolf Creek? And to be honest, I don't think it will be. The, the conditions on that side of the forest are not as conducive to these huge numbers of beetles. The Rio Grande going up into Wolf Creek Pass very pure stands of spruce. I mean, you, I showed you that risk rating thing about the big, old, dense, pure stands. As we come uh, further west, we start to lose some of that. And where's Dave? Dave Crawford here are, is uh, knowledgeable about history and talks about some of the, the tie hacking they did in the old days and a lot of the cutting they did in that, that mining country. And I'm sure in those days people were saying, you know, what a, what a big... Uh, impact that was being on the forest, and yet all these years later, because those stands are younger, I think they're less susceptible. And I don't think, I think as the beetle moves west, I think we're going to catch a break. Now, I know somebody's going to come at a meeting here a few years from now <laughs> and say, you told us the beetles weren't going to kill the, <laughs> the trees. But uh, I, I, I think uh, in this, these western parts of the, of the state, we, we shouldn't see as, as big a problem as we have in other places. The trees are, the stands are younger. And there's more of a mix of species there. In, in purgatory itself, it was of a, some of the earliest in Purgatory itself, some of the earliest spruce logging on the on the old Animus district was right there in that ski area. This was in the late forties and early fifties, and I I've seen this on the photography, you can go into the aerial, the old 1950s aerial photography, some of the earliest we have. And that whole, pretty much that whole ski area was cut over and logged. Um, so a lot of the big trees are gone. They made some classic mistakes of cutting the stands too heavily. If you're skiing through Harris Park, which was an old blowdown, because they cut it too heavy. Everything around the ski area has been logged at least once. Some of the stands to the south of it have even been logged twice. Uh, so yeah, like Tom says, there's a lot of old history there that is probably going to affect that graph or those, those statistics on the stands. Um, who knows, though, huh? <laughs> Make a prediction, Dave. <laughs> You're getting paid those bucks. <laughs> All right, thank you. Those of you that don't know Dave Crawford, a longtime Columbine forester and civil culturist. And I used to always call him the professor because anytime I needed a question answered about trees, this guy knew it. Okay, thank you so much, Walt and a few others. I'm sorry um, to postpone your question, but Lori's presentation is very short, so 
Thank you so much, sure. Tom. I apologize for putting you off. <laughs> and yes. And Tom will be right back up here in 10 minutes, guys. So we have Lori Swisher. Lori is a forester on the San Juan National Forest. She received her degree in forest management from UC Berkeley. Yes, I know. I went to a UC school, but don't hold that against us, OK? And Lori began her career with the Forest Service in 1984 on the Gunnison National Forest. After a few years working on the Mount Baker Snoqualmie in Washington State, she came down here to the San Juan. That was in 1990. And why would you go anywhere else, right, Lori? That's right. Absolutely. She is our San Juan National Forest Vegetation Database Manager on the forest. And that involves ensuring that the vegetation on the landscape, which of course is continually changing, is accurately reflected in order to inform land management decisions. And Lori, you're going to tell them a lot more about that, and you're going to give us a little snapshot of current conditions on the San Juan, right? Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. <laughs> well, Tom gave a really good overview of the spruce beetle and other agents across the state, what, the, what kind of impacts the spruce beetle, beetle has done across the state. What I'm going to focus on is kind of zeroing right in on the San Juan National Forest. What does that look like for us here on the San Juan? Um, according to those aerial surveys that Tom talked about, we have about 209,000 acres of forested lands that have been affected by the spruce beetle. Now, most of those lands are in the spruce fir. Some of them have slopped over into our cool, moist, mixed conifer, as Tom was talking about up by Cascade, where we have some blue spruce being affected. One of the things I would like to mention about the data, as Tom talked about, it's kind of a coarse filter, those aerial bug surveys are a coarse filter looking at what we have on the ground. We're going to be having a huge effort this summer to get folks on the ground and conduct field surveys to better refine what kind of impact we're looking at with the spruce beetle. So our numbers may change from what, you know, this current, what we say is 209,000 acres. They may change a little bit. So right now, I just wanted to show you what we're looking at in the spruce across the forest. And is that full screen? Yeah. So let me get the pointer here and a microphone. Should we dim, Should we dim the lights a little so you all can see? All right, so what we're looking at here, this is um, a map of the San Juan National Forest. So the blue outline here is the San Juan National Forest boundary, divided into its districts. So you have the Dolores District over here to the west, Columbine District in the middle, and the Pagosa District over on the east side. And just to kind of get you a little more familiar, so right here, Pagosa Springs, here's Highway 160 going up over Wolf Creek Pass, where a lot of you are familiar with that beetle activity. Um, Durango is here, Highway 550 going up into Silverton, and then we have Highway 145 going up northeast from Dolores. The, um, the gray areas in this map are the wilderness areas or special management areas. So we have up here is Lizard Head Pass, and of course that goes outside of the Na San Juan National Forest boundary. But this is Lizard Head Pass. We have the newly designated Hermosa area, the Hermosa Special Management area, Wimanooch Wilderness, which goes clear over, encompasses quite a large area, the Piedra area, and the Lizard Head, or the South San Juan Wilderness area. And one thing to notice, OK, so, so what we're looking at here is the spruce beetle activity that was detected by those aerial surveys, and we're looking at cumulatively since 2006. 2006 is when we really started noticing that bark beetle activity up over on Wolf Creek Pass. And the two colors, the pink and the green, are all the spruce fir stands that we have on the forest. The pink area here are where those areas where spruce beetle activity has been detected. The green areas are the spruce where, as of 
yet there has been no bark beetle activity detected. So one thing that comes really clear on this picture is a lot of the activity is in the wilderness areas. And as Tom and Kara had mentioned, those are hands-off areas. And we, we cannot do any management in those wilderness areas. And so when you look at all these areas and you go, holy cow, there's, what are we going to do with all those stands in areas where we can manage? What does that look like? And both Kara and Tom talked about areas that were too steep or we had um, maybe soil erosion problems. There's actually a process that we use on the National Forest to determine where we can actually do forest management activities. And what that is, is it's, it's determined by the National Forest Management Act and other planning regulations. So essentially what happens is you take your whole land base in your national forest and you start picking out, excluding areas that you will not be able to do any forest management. So the first thing that we do is we take out those lands that they don't have trees. I mean, you know, grasslands, uh, your shrub areas, your high alpine areas, areas that don't grow tree, don't grow trees. So we exclude that, we take those pieces out. And then the next thing we do is exclude those areas that are precluded from harvest. So we take out our wilderness areas. So then what you're kind of left with are those areas that are forested, but we can't do management activity in them because of wilderness designation or some other statute. From there, we start looking at those areas where, as they talked about, we have the conditions, if we were to, to go in and harvest, would cause irreversible damage to the landscape. So we're talking about steep slopes, unstable slopes. We take those out of the picture now. The final thing that we do, according to the National Forest Management Act, is we look at areas where we don't think we're going to be able, should we go in and harvest, we don't think that we could get adequate restocking of little seedlings after harvest. The National Forest Management Act requires that you have reforestation within five years of harvest. So we're looking at areas that may be on poor site conditions, maybe they have trees on them right now, but we don't think that if we went in there and harvested, we would get adequate regeneration. So when you take all those out of the picture, this is what we're looking at on the San Juan. I keep wanting to do this touch screen. Okay. All right, so what this map shows essentially are those areas now that we actually can do management activities. So you can see we no longer have any of these um, stands that we're looking at that are in the wilderness. We do still show stands in the Hermosa area because there are areas in there that we can do some harvest. I forgot to mention that when we break that down, we get that final area where we can potentially do harvest. We break that down once again into two parts. One area is we consider, we call it suitable for timber production. Another area, you can go out and harvest timber, but for other resource management objectives, for wildlife reasons or recreation or livestock grazing. So on the San Juan, what you see here in the pink and the green are those areas that are potentially right now suitable for timber harvest. It ends up being about 177,000 acres of 500,000 acres of spruce on the San Juan. And when you look at this picture, the pink, again, is where we've detected spruce beetle activity. The green is where we don't have spruce beetle activity detected yet. And the activity has occurred in about 20% of those lands that are suitable. Um, and so, as Tom and Kara mentioned, what does that mean? What can we do? What are some of our options on these suitable lands? Well, of course, our first priority, again, is safety. So we're going to go and do hazard tree removal where we can in areas that have the highest impact, uh, trails, roads, campgrounds. The timber sale receipts that we get from those timber sales and put that back into reforesting those stands that we've done salvage logging on. So we can reforest them, we can do weed treatments, we can do other necessary recovery treatments in those stands. And again, to reiterate what they also mentioned, we also have options to go in and reforest in some areas where we may not be even doing salvage logging, but we can go and reforest. 
we can do seed cone collection to ensure that we have an adequate supply of seed source to do this reforestation recovery in these areas. So that's pretty much the short and sweet of what we've got going on on the San Juan right now. We look forward to all of your participation as we go through this process in developing a spruce first strategy. So thank you. Thank you, Lori. And I just realized um, we had so many buggy questions, we're running a little bit late. From here, we are going to have Kara, Lori, and Tom come to the front, and we'll take more questions. And then um, we'll have Kara wrap up. So I apologize for going a little over, but um, it was so interesting. How, how could you stop? So come on up. And I guess for the li live stream, I'll repeat the phone number one more time. 970-769-7743. So, come on up. Would you rather sit? You can have a chair, too. Yeah, all right. Let's. All right, so, who has the first question? Dave? The question was, what do we spray with if we want to try to prevent the trees from being affected by the beetle? There's two registered materials. One is carbaryl, the trade name seven, and the other one's permethrin, and that goes under several different names. One of them's safari. But the, it's not just the material. It, it's Of all the trees, again, spruce is the, the toughest one because you got to get that stuff well up into the crown. And you really need some professional equipment. You need to get like 400 PSI to get that material up onto the bowl of the tree. So I have seen situations where homeowners groups have purchased that equipment and done it themselves. But for the most part, they're going to uh, professional tree care uh, companies. OK, we'll go there. For bark beetles... And the question was? Uh, the question are was... Are there oh, injectable man. systemics? So th there's uh, processes like for uh, emerald ash borer, which I think you've heard of from the East Coast, the invasive insect, and that bores into the tree. So you have to sort of go back and look at your, your tree anatomy. So w the way a tree works is roots are picking up moisture and nutrients, and they're carrying it up in the wood, the inner part of the tree, and it's going all the way up to the, the leaves eventually, and then the leaves are doing photosynthesis, and they're sending that back down through the phloem, that sugar-rich material that bark beetles feed on, and it's going into the roots. So there's a, a process where you can inject uh, insecticidal chemicals into the tree, and if these uh, organisms are living in the wood of the tree, such as this emerald ash borer, and there's a, a number of others, those are efficacious treatments. You can get that material to where the insects are. But in the case of bark beetles, you remember, they're living on the outer part of the tree and feeding on the phloem. So they have not been able to find a way to inject those materials into the, into the phloem area where bark beetles are. So, so far, there's been no demonstrated efficacy of injectables for phloem feeding bark beetles. They're, they're, believe me, though, there are people working on it. Walt Brown, do you still have your question left over from earlier? So the question was, yeah. <laughs> what, is the, what is the role of bark beetles in long-term forest cycling and what Let's talk up a little bit about natural enemies of, of bark beetles. And they, let's start with the natural enemies part. They've been around a long time. They've co-evolved with their host trees. So at the same time, they're, they're part of this ecosystem to where there's other organisms feeding on them. So the number one predator of spruce beetles, you, bet you all know it already, 
woodpeckers. These woodpeckers are just, the populations we've seen in some areas are, are visibly increasing in response to these bark beetle uh, populations. So there's, there's woodpeckers, number one, but there's also a whole range of things. So if a bark beetle attacks a tree in that course of that lifespan, they've documented over 125 other organisms coming into that tree. So that when the bark beetles are coming in, I didn't talk about the blue stain or the fungus they're carrying in with them, but they're, they're carrying these, these other organisms with them. There are mites that actually, actually hitchhike on the bark beetle. If you peel some bark beetles out of a tree and you get a hand lens, you'll see these little tiny mites that are, are right, getting a free ride because mites don't have wings. That's how they get from tree to tree. They jump on the bark beetle. Believe it or not, they, people have studied this. They know when the bark beetle's about to leave. Uh, they haven't figured out how they know it, but just about when, they, when they're about ready to emerge from their host tree and find a new host, they crawl onto the, the bark beetle and go to the new tree. So there's mites that feed on the fungus that are being carried around. There are mites that feed on the mites. There are nematodes that feed on the beetle larvae. There's a whole series of parasites and predators. There's the disease we talked about earlier. So there's a whole range of natural enemies of bark beetles. But in terms of manipulating them for management purposes, very difficult to achieve on a landscape basis. The next part of the question was about the, the role of bark beetles in the long-term cycling of forests. And yeah, it's a, you know, I had people argue with me over this, this terminology, symbiosis, where you have two organisms that are working together for their mutual benefit. And I think it is a symbiosis because these bark beetles are killing these older trees and clearing the way for the next generation. So th they're out there furthering this successional pattern. You know, the, the trees get old, they start to get weak, they, you know, they start to decline over time, and it's the bark beetles that come in and clean the slate and start clear the forest for the next generation. So a huge ecological role here. What we as humans, and we're, I'm definitely putting human values on this now, is that it's happening on such a large scale. I'm not saying it didn't happen before. I'm not saying it's not natural. But the scale of it is such that our grandkids are not going to see the type of forest that we have experienced in our own time. And this is my personal opinion, is that we would be better off by, again, diversifying the forest, having these, instead of these huge events occurring over huge spans of time, smaller events occurring on a more regular basis by deliberately introducing uh, types of disturbance, such as, as tree removals on our own, and trying to get a diverse landscape out there. Next question. Certainly the Forest Service or um, any intervention probably could have really dealt with. Um, now we're into a phase where we're, we're kind of resigned to, and we've, we've gone into to, uh, transplanting a lot of trees. And um, while the very small saplings um, are a component of that, um, we are using tree spades and, and moving bigger trees. Should we be spraying those trees to keep them from being eaten? They're, they're only maybe six to eight feet tall, four to six feet tall. You, that's a, a, a risk, a cost and risk type thing. And if it, it depends on how much effort and how much uh, financial outlay. It probably wouldn't hurt you, those six to eight inches, to, to give them a dose of, of insecticide for at least a, a year or two. And, and get them through that critical period when they're under stress. You know, when you spade them out, you're cutting a lot of those fine roots. And when you move them to a new spot, they'll start uh, producing those fine roots again and reestablishing themselves, but they're at a vulnerable stage. It's, it's almost like inoculating them, you know, to prevent the beetles from getting to them. And, if, you know, if I was putting a lot of time and effort into them, I'd give some serious thought to, to treating those trees uh, post-transplantation. Mark. Well, you know, your grandmaster forces now have uh, like nearly 12 years of 
Before we get to study talks and things we're going to read here or listen to again, in both the spruce fir forest as well as the mixed conifer forest. So my question is, what kind of aspen regrowth are you seeing in some of those study plot areas? Yeah, so the, the question is, is, is asking about, they've been tracking the, the other species that grow in these spruce fir stands, particularly the, the regen from the spruce, the regen uh, coming in for, from fir. But what about aspen? What's going on out there? And thank goodness for aspen. You know, it's a lot of places on the Rio Grande, they were, they were doing intensive surveys on these hillsides prior to treating the removal of the dead trees, doing salvage logging, and saying there's no aspen up here. And time and time again, these, the, the aspen has responded to that heat on the forest floor, and they have, have gotten aspen where they didn't think they were going to get it at all. So uh, aspen has, has been a, a, a very positive surprise in that situation. I think, you know, it's, it's kind of the uh, eraser on our pencil here. It's, it's really going to... Uh, help us out in a lot of situations. So I, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, Aspen, we're going to get it in places we didn't think we were going to get it, and it's it's probably going to uh, change forest conditions for the better in a lot of situations. So, yeah, that, you know, we don't want it to all be doom and gloom. There's, there's some good stuff going on. I like that. The San Juan will be the Aspen jewel of the nation. All right. Aaron. <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much. I really appreciate the class and the work that you're doing here at this guy Rock and doing this program. I just uh, think it's a very worthy step. And I've had the opportunity to work in the San Juan Headwaters Club for a partnership with the Gazelle Club. And we just kind of experienced it as just sitting here and like um, across the spectrum of what kind of opinions and things about this dialogue. Yeah, the, the, the question was about uh, study plots here on the San Juan National Forest, and particularly on the, where the most intense activity on Pagosa side, there's already been a, a few, a several master's theses has come out of there, and there are a number of different folks uh, putting in plots. We have the, something called FIA, Forest Inventory and Analysis, and they maintain permanent plots. So the, the beauty of that, it wasn't, you know, we. One of the big problems with a lot of this uh, bark beetle research is the freight train takes off and you have a lot of bark beetles out there and people start their projects and then the bark beetles go away and then you have a whole generation that doesn't study bark beetles. But in the case of FIA, we actually have these established permanent plots prior to the beetle. So we're going to actually see you know, what the stand conditions were like prior to beetle, immediately after the, the outbreak, and then following those plots into the future there. So there, there is a system of, of permanent plots out there, and there have been several studies done to monitor the situation. There, there's a lot of people, the, the eyes of the nation are on the, the San Juan and the Rio Grande following this process here. So Tom, uh -oh. let's go to our live stream. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> you're not in trouble <laughs> yet. Oh, oh, oh. So, we have, what is the lifespan of an adult female, and can she lay more than one brood of eggs? So more than 80 to 150 in her life. Yeah, there, there's uh, most, I'll say 75 to 80% of the attacking females, they go in and they, they lay their eggs and they're done. They, they pass away at that point. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and there's always the but with etymology questions. There's about 20% we call re-emergent beetles. They'll go in, they'll lay their contingent of eggs, and while they're laying eggs, they're actually feeding, and for some reason, a certain percentage of them are, will come out, fly to a different tree, and attack another tree here. So there's uh, a certain percentage of those beetles that are re-emergent beetles, 
and will uh, reattack more than once. And it's it's actually pretty interesting. You can you can take the the females out of trees and and dissect them. You know, open them up and look inside. And you can look at the their egg produce the ovarials, and it's really easy to tell. Uh, if you look inside the beetles, you can you can count out these ones that have done this reemergent reattack thing. So uh, that's that's fairly well studied. It's an interesting thing. Great. We are about ten minutes over right now. I, I think what we'll do is we'll take two more quick questions. We are going to wrap with Kara, and then anybody who wants to stay and learn more um, about anything from our speakers, please please do. So two more. I'll go here. My question is just on the logistics of this planning, kind of when are you planning to have the meetings and do you have a target for getting a management plan? Yeah, that's part of my closing. So maybe I can take care of that now. So what we want to do, this was just the beginning and I'm hoping that all of you are interested in staying engaged with us because after this we will be scheduling meetings at each of the districts open house type meetings where we'll have these maps and we'll start looking at areas um, and having a dialogue with all of you about where we should start treating what you think the prior what you think our priorities should be we're also looking at potentially having a field trip maybe over to the Rio Grande and see what they've done over there since um, I don't know what we'll show them here so we are planning on you know, additional meetings, more input, and engaging you the entire way. So please stay engaged with us. We really would appreciate that. And you know, that was my opportunity for the closing. And this has been one of the easiest Q&As for Lori and I. So thank you, Tom. I think we've learned a lot about uh, the, you know, the spruce beetle tonight. And um, I think we've heard a lot about the need out there. And so now we just want to hear from you. So. Thank you for that question. All right, so I guess, um, do you want to make that a wrap? And then anybody who wants to stay, please stay. We'll do some more Q&A. Um, the one thing I would like to, to say, first of all, thank you, Tom. Never, <laughs> yes, and in fact, <laughs> not, just, not just Tom, but also Laurie and Kara. Really appreciate it. And the other people I'd like to thank right now are the folks behind the scenes. Kara Gildar. Yay. Yes. And Shauna Jensen and Ann Bond. Where are you, Ann? You're back there. Right. And also, thank you, Mitch, for live streaming. It was great. We had people out there interested. Um, yeah, but... I'm sorry? Oh, <laughs> thank you, Sherry. Never did I think I would be so interested in beetle bugs or what do you call that? Fungi or mites or any of that. So thank you so much. It's a fascinating look at what's going on. And for those of you that didn't get your fill of beetles, guess what? Our partners, the California, the Cal. Oh! Sorry, Ken. The Colorado State um, Forest Service. <laughs> Pretend like I didn't say that, I know. <laughs> they and the Firewise Council to be hosting a forest health workshop, right, Kent? It's going to be April 15th, and you have your bug guy, Dan West, who will be there on hand to answer questions, right? Anything else you want to add, Kent? Well, this is a workshop that'll be at the La Plata County Fairgrounds on Wednesday, uh, April 15th, tax day. And uh, so anyway, um, we have our entomologist, he's just new, he's coming down and going to give a talk on forest insect and disease here in southwest Colorado. We'll include the spruce beetle, but also other bark beetles and other uh, forest uh, insects and diseases. So anyone uh, that would like to come to that, we'd be love to have you there. There'll be refreshments. Uh, I think steak and lobster, but um, no. <laughs> but anyway, so so, if you didn't get enough tonight, like like Pauline said, please uh, come in for more in about a, a month. Thank you. So, again, reminding you how you can comment. Um, you'll be hearing more from the Forest Service. 
through news releases and whatnot on when our follow-up meetings will be. Please, if you have questions or whatever comments to make, please go ahead and make them on those sheets. You can leave them up here with Kara. Um, the other thing, I think Kara listed the speakers' names up here and their contact information. So as you're walking out, if you have a question, I don't think we have your phone number. Do you mind? Okay, great. Um, Lori, Kara, and Kara work in the Durango office for the San Juan um, National Forest. So they have the same number. And then put your number over there by your name. It'd be great. I know I'm always telling him what to do. I'm sorry, Tom. I don't mean to. <laughs> but that's another way um, to get in touch, okay? So once again, I think we'll call it a wrap. Thanks so much for spending your St. Patrick's evening with us. And um, thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>